questions about the Bible today on the Janet Mefford Show. A little bit more like uh, what I'm used to doing on my own webcast called The Dividing Line, where we uh, take phone calls and we answer difficult questions. Let me give an example of what I'm uh, talking about. Uh, we once did an entire hour-long program, and uh, we don't have commercial breaks and stuff uh, when you're on a webcast. You don't have to do stuff like that. And so uh, we spent an entire hour. I had a guest, a friend of mine by the name of Alan Kirshner, and uh, we did the entire hour on a single textual variant in the New Testament. Scintillating, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You're going, please don't do that. Well, some people actually find that interesting. Uh, but what we did is we examined the textual variant found at Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Now, I will confess to having gone through most of, well, all of Bible college and most of seminary without ever having realized that there is a major and important textual variant in the New Testament manuscripts at Luke 23, 34. And specifically, it is one of the most famous words of Jesus that almost everybody has memorized, but may not know that they actually have it memorized in the sense they know the words, but they don't necessarily know where to find it. Uh, and it's no, it's not judge, not lest you be judged. <laughs> it's Luke 23, 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That's a major text of variant. What I mean is there are a number of manuscripts, early manuscripts, one, well, actually, most of the earliest manuscripts in regards to the text of the book of Luke do not contain that phrase. It's not there. And in fact, a wide variety of of the earliest witnesses. It's not just what's called the Alexandrian text, but a wide variety of those early witnesses do not contain that. You can learn a lot about a man by pondering some of his last words. This is especially true if his death is particularly painful and strenuous. Once everything has been stripped away, every distraction is gone and time on earth is coming to an end, what parting message does he have for those who remain? That depends on what kind of person he is. Let's look at three examples, Jesus, Muhammad, and Nabil Qureshi. Before his crucifixion, Jesus was lashed with a Roman flagrum, which was made with leather thongs with chunks of bone or metal woven into the strands. We know historically what a flagrum would do to a person. We have ancient reports of people being beaten until their veins and arteries were exposed. The Jewish historian Josephus writes about people being flogged until their bones were showing or until their intestines spilled out. The first century philosopher Seneca describes victims of crucifixion as battered, misshapen, and deformed due in large part to the beatings they received. After the scourging came the crucifixion. The Romans hammered large nails through Jesus' wrists and ankles to keep him firmly attached to a wooden cross. Now, as Jesus hung on this cross, barely recognizable, skin dangling like ribbons, muscles and inner tissues exposed, covered only by his own drying yet still flowing blood, what message did he want to convey to those who were gathered around him? He said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So during his ministry, Jesus ordered his followers to love their enemies and to pray for their persecutors. And when he was crucified, he practiced what he preached. He asked the Father to forgive the people who had tortured, mocked, and crucified him. So uh, we... Pray for Nabil's family. Uh, we pray for David Wood. Um, let me say something about David. David's, you know, I've said on this program that David's testimony video is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And David does deal with certain Muslims who tend to, you know, it's sort of like the pal talk level stuff. And and I, I don't, and David knows I don't agree with how he responds to some of them, basically egging them on. I don't think, I don't think that's wise. Um, I wouldn't do it. But David stands before his Lord, not before me. I'm not his judge. 
David has to answer just like I'm going to have to answer. And I'm not his judge. And if I say, I don't think that's wise, it does not mean I think the man should be kicked to the curb. It does not mean I don't pray for him. He's brilliant. Do I agree with all of his arguments against Islam? No, I don't. I don't. I, I, think, I think sometimes there are arguments that he presents that, you know, one of my one of my issues, and we're going to get into this when we talk, start talking about the Lycona thing, is we've got to be painstakingly consistent. We can't utilize forms of argumentation that are used against us just because it's used against us. Well, I'm going to turn around and use it against you. I just don't think we can do that. And I think that when you make your arguments, you should do it in such a way where you are expecting your audience, you're presenting the best form of the argument, assuming that your audience is going to give the best response from the other side. And, you know, for example, in uh, the video that, uh, that, that David put up, uh, one Muslim pointed out that one of the quotes that David gave is a questionable quote on a textual critical foundation. Specifically, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I think we need to be just straight up front and recognize that that is a textual variant and that there is good reason to question its originality. Um, okay, that's fair game. Does that mean I don't love David? No, it doesn't. I, I really... It just, <sighs> David, David's going to answer to his Lord the same way that I am and the same way Nabil will. And if I feel there's a, there's reason to go, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to explain why. And then it's up to David to deal with it from there. It doesn't mean that I'm going to kick. I can't, I can't kick anybody out of the kingdom of heaven. Everybody wants to, wants people to do that. I, I can say this is a teaching that is dangerous. This is a teaching that is heretical. This is a teaching that'll damn your soul. I can deal with those things, but I can't deal with hearts. I can't look into someone's soul. I can't see what their relationship with God is. And it really gets dangerous when people start demanding that you do that. It really does. It's, it gets a little scary. So anyway, I'm sorry. I, uh, I started going on, on and on there. Just, just so people understand. Nabil was a brilliant young man. Huge heart. And he's going to be missed. And you should pray for David Wood. David's hurting. They were close friends. And I pray for David Wood. We may have disagreements on methodology, but from my perspective, anybody who reads hatred or anything else into disagreement, you just don't understand how I think you understand. It's not like I haven't been talking about this stuff for a long, long time, but I pray for David. David's my brother in the Lord and whether he will acknowledge me or not is up to him. I've not heard him say anything that I'm not a Christian or anything else. Pray for the whole situation. And that God would be glorified in, um, in that situation. That's, that's what any saint wants your death to be, is something that's going to glorify God. Uh, your homecoming needs to be something that glorifies the one who has, who has saved you. One of Jesus' most memorable lines is in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. It's found only in Luke. He's being nailed to the cross, and Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. But the verses are not found in some of our oldest and best manuscripts. Were the, was that verse originally, did Jesus originally say the prayer or not? It depends which manuscript you read. 